Good evening. Welcome to the 2024 C. Henry Smith Peace Oratorical Contest. Those of us in the communication department have been looking forward to this night for months, for weeks, and now here it is. My name is Anna Groff, Assistant Professor of Communication and Contest Director. I appreciate all of you who came out to the Humble Center tonight and those of you that are watching on the live stream. It is you all, the supportive audience, that is a crucial part of this campus tradition of speech making. And year after year, we gather because of a shared passion for the power of words. So thank you so much tonight for being here. I am so pleased to have the winner from last year's contest with us here tonight, Ja'Kyra Green. Ja'Kyra is a senior English and secondary education major. She went on to finish first in the binational contest sponsored by Mennonite Central Committee for her speech, The Privilege of Peace. We are also grateful to Jakaira and professors in the comm department for serving as judges in the preliminary round this year. A special thank you to Joshua Weaver, who served as a speech coach for the finalist. Joshua is a Goshen College and Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary graduate. He has a background in debate and is a high school Bible religion and social studies teacher at Bethany Christian Schools. Also a special welcome to President Stolzfus for being with us this evening. Some quick history. In 1907, the first intercollegiate peace association contest was held here. Then in 1974, the directors of the C. Henry Smith Trust established a peace oratorical contest in the name of the late C. Henry Smith. C. Henry Smith was a Mennonite historian and professor here at Goshen College and Bluffton University and had a deep interest in the Mennonite peace position. This year is the 50th anniversary of the trust's sponsorship of the contest. And so in recognition of that important milestone, the trust generously approved a one-time prize money increase. So this year, the first place winner will receive $1,000 and second place will receive 400. We are so grateful for this increase and how it elevates the excitement for the evening. Now let's recognize our three judges for the contest tonight. And I invite the judges to stand during their introduction. And let's save the applause until I have introduced all three. Dr. Regina Shan Stolzfus teaches in the Peace, Justice, Conflict Studies, and Bible, Religion, and Philosophy departments. She has previously served as chair of the Religion, Justice, and Society Department. Her courses include race, class, and ethnic relations, personal violence and healing, spiritual path of the peacemaker, and transforming conflict and violence. She is co-founder with Tobin Miller Shear of the Roots of Justice Anti-Oppression Program, formerly Damascus Road Anti-Racism Program. She and Tobin are co-authors of the book been in the struggle, pursuing an anti-racist spirituality. Regina has worked in peace education with the Ohio Conference of the Mennonite Church, Mennonite Central Committee US, and Mennonite Mission Network. She holds a Master's of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Ashland Theological Seminary and a PhD in Theology and Ethics from Chicago Theological Seminary. Dr. Melinda Elizabeth Berry is a passionate advocate of peace theology and nonviolence. Melinda currently serves as Associate Professor of Theology and Ethics, as well as Director of the Faith Formation Collaborative at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana. As well as being a graduate of AMBS and Union Theological Seminary in New York, Melinda is a 1996 graduate of Goshen College. She treasures memories of late nights in the record office and playing cello playing in the cello section of the orchestra pit here in the Humble Center. In 2023, Melinda completed a term of service on the GC board. She and her spouse, John Stolzfus, live in Goshen with their two school-aged chicken children, <laughs> a flock of chickens, a tank of fish, and Justice, their German shepherd. Thank you, Melinda. 
Dr. Luke Beck Kreider is Assistant Professor of Religion and Sustainability at Goshen College, where he teaches classes on peace and justice, religion, ethics, and environmental studies. His position at GC is shared between the Department of Religion, Justice, and Society, based in Wise Hall, and the Department of Sustainability and Environmental Education, based at Mary Lee, where he helps run the sustainability semester in residence each fall. He is a graduate of Goshen College, Yale, and the University of Virginia. He was born in Virginia, now lives in Goshen with his wife and their two energetic preschoolers. Join me in thanking and recognizing our judges for this evening. And now on to our five finalists who passed through a preliminary competition last month. They have all worked very, very hard shaping and polishing and practicing their speeches. And I will describe just a few of the steps that they've taken. They have worked with written comments from the communication department on their manuscript. They named and met with one faculty or staff mentor throughout this process for further support. They watched videos of previous winning speeches and they attended individual sessions here in the Humble Center with the speech coach, Joshua Weaver. And then just this afternoon, they had a final private run-through session here on the Humble stage. I know that they have invested very deeply in their speeches and topics, and you will see that in just a few moments. And a quick note, the order of the speakers that they will present in and that you see in the program was done by a random drawing. Our finalists were each invited to prepare a short bio to be shared as part of their introduction. Speakers, will you please stand as I introduce you one at a time? And once again, we'll hold the applause until I've introduced all five. Our first speaker is Sarah Lopez Ramirez. Sarah is a senior film production major and art minor, the student producer for Five Core Media. Last summer, she was part of Maple Scholars and worked on a documentary that is currently in post-production about Latino immigrants in the community. Our next speaker is Cassidy Swartnia. Cassidy is a senior American Sign Language interpretation major from Lake Zurich, Illinois. At 21 years old, she spends her time reading, playing video games, and spending time with friends and family. She's involved in Campus Activities Council and works for ITSM on campus. Cassidy identifies as white, female, neurodivergent, and queer. She wants to give a special hello to her mother, Sandy, and family friend, Eric, who are here in the audience tonight. Our third speaker is Annika Alderfer Fisher, a senior sociology and art major from Stanton, Virginia. Outside of her studies, she's involved as a member of the cross country and track teams, a writer and copy editor for the record, and an admissions employee. Annika is interested in planning and design and plans to pursue a master's in urban and regional planning and a career in designing the built environment for healthy and sustainable communities. And after graduation, she plans to move to Philadelphia. Fourth up is Tyson Miller, a junior journalism and English major from Syracuse, Indiana. On campus, he works with The Globe, The Record, and Pinchpenny Press. He also takes photos for the communications and marketing office and stage manages shows in the Souter Concert Hall. In high school, Tyson was planning on a pre-med track but ultimately decided to go into communication and has never regretted it. And our final speaker for the evening is Mariela Esparza, a senior English major from Elkhart. Last spring, she was an executive co-editor for The Record she currently serves as one of the English department's Horswell's Publishing Fellows. She is a BSU leader and a member of the Goshen Monologues Committee. Let's give a round of applause for the five finalists. I invite you all to tuck your devices away, make sure they're turned off, as you prepare to listen to these five wonderful speeches on timely topics related to peace and justice. We will begin with Sarah and then follow the order in the program. First though, prior to our first speech, I would like to invite campus pastor Jen Shank to the front to offer some words of reflection and a prayer. After this, Sarah will begin her speech. Thank you.
In times like these, we are aware, perhaps more than ever, of the need for peace. Peace in our hearts, in our neighborhoods, in our country, and in our world. Here at Goshen College, we are an Anabaptist faith institution committed to the ways of nonviolence and following in the footsteps of Jesus. These students you will hear from tonight are bearing witness to glimpses of God's reign here on earth. They are sharing their testimony and helping us imagine a world where hatred, violence, injustice, and oppression have no place. These students are showing up. They are shining a light. They are raising their voices, and they are doing the work of integration, application, participation, and collaboration in the work of God as peacemakers. Tonight, you will hear many words, but let one word settle in your mind and take up space in your heart. Peace. Please pray with me. In the words of St. Francis of Assisi, Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And now, let's prepare to enter into a time of blessing as these students bless us with their challenge and their inspiration, and as we bless them with our presence and our attention, and with another round of applause. Let's welcome our first speaker, Sarah, to the stage. First are remembered forever. First concert, first bike ride without training wheels, first kiss, and everyone can remember their first job. The uneasiness of entering adulthood, the drive to be more independent, and the gratification that comes from that sweet, sweet paycheck. Eighth grade was the first time I applied for a job. I applied for a position at a local farm. Jobs range from long hours in the sun, greeting guests, to cleaning after animals. But I didn't mind. I was ready to enter the workforce. I received a call from the owner. She wanted to interview me. It was minimum wage pay, but I was so excited that in my mind, I had already spent the money I hadn't yet earned. My mom dropped me off for my interview. I lightly trembled as I approached the wooden porch where the owner was sitting. But luckily, after minor stutters and some coherent answers, she offered me a job. She handed me a bright blue folder, set a few sheets on top, and lightly tapped on the heading of the paper and explained that the business had moved on from paying in cash and I required a youth work permit. I had no clue what that meant, so I just smiled and said I would give it to her as soon as possible. I thanked her, said goodbye, and walked to the car. After a big sigh of relief, I opened the door and told my mom everything. I could see how excited she was for me. Her smile was contagious, and it made me proud of what I had just accomplished. I scored my first job. 
I handed my mom my folder and the work, paper, the work permit paperwork. Her smile faded and her eyebrows lifted. She gave me sympathetic eyes and explained that she didn't think I could apply for this, but that we would give it a try. The next morning, we went to the South Bend Community School Corporation. They confirmed my mom's worries. I could not apply because I didn't have a social security number. At that time, I didn't know what this meant, but I did know I was missing something important. I had to inform the farm manager that I could no longer apply. I felt somewhat embarrassed. And I know I didn't, need, I didn't have a reason to feel this way, but I felt like I had done something wrong. My job experience never came. It hasn't happened yet. And I know that I said that no one can forget their first job, but I can't forget the time that I learned that nine digits would keep me away from mine. My story is just one example of the reality that thousands of immigrants face. The roots of limitation spread through all stages of life, but mainly affect retirement. These roots come not only from the lack of social security number, but from ITIN. ITIN stands for Individual Taxpayer Identification Number. According to the American Immigration Council, ITIN is a tax processing number issued by the IRS to ensure that people, including undocumented immigrants, pay taxes no matter if they don't have a social security number and regardless of their immigration status. An ITIN brings money into the U.S. Treasury every year. But what an ITIN doesn't do for its recipients is the following. An ITIN is not allowed to get a driver's license in 31 states, Indiana being one of them. This forces immigrants to not drive at all or to drive with an expired license or no license. The freedom and need of transportation gets turned into fear of getting stopped on the road. An ITIN is not accepted in most banks, so building credit or taking a loan is very difficult. We live in a credit-based society, so how is someone supposed to climb up the ladder of the American dream without credit? An ITIN does not authorize work, so immigrants are pushed to make a very difficult choice. A social security number is needed to work. Work is needed to survive. The choice is this. Make a fake social security number or borrow one that isn't theirs. They live with the fear of being caught and a taste of embarrassment for their actions, but they must feed their families. The definition of an item by itself sounds contradictory. Immigrants are not allowed to work here cannot receive any kind of government aid, cannot receive a retirement pension, but they're all still expected to pay taxes like every citizen. How is this fair? Why do you think immigrants take the labor-intensive jobs? Think of your city. Who is filling those factories? Who is filling the jobs that slowly break down the body and no one wants? Factories, never city lifting heavy parts, sanding car pieces, inspecting hundreds of items a day, tiring the mind and body. Hotel cleaning, dishwashing, and construction are just a few of the examples of the jobs immigrants must choose. Some might say immigrants choose these jobs because they might have a lower education or they're just easier to access. But the full reality is that these jobs don't check the validity of a social security number. No matter what occupation an immigrant might have had back in their country, these are the only jobs they can have. Citizens often have the privilege of avoiding these jobs, but immigrants don't have a choice. The, the sole existence of an item is a mockery of what immigrants are not allowed to do but what is still expected from them. An ITIN is not eligible for social security benefits. According to the new American economy, undocumented immigrants contributed 13 billion in social security funds in 2016. Because an immigrant uses a false social security number to work and files taxes with an ITIN, 
A W-2 tax form cannot be matched to the correct Social Security number. They will put money every year into Social Security, but never receive a cent. After many years of hard work, many immigrants, many people look on to retirement. Sadly, this is not the case for many people. Many immigrants are like my childhood neighbors. Let's call them Maria and Juan. They came into this country when they were 20 and have worked ever since. They're still working, but not by choice. They need to work to survive. Maria works at a factory sewing couches. Her hands are steady, but as time goes by, they will begin to tremble and ache. Juan works at another factory where they build RVs. He carries and assembles pieces of metal. His back is strong, but as time goes by, the weight will push him down. They're currently 65, but retirement is not a plan for them. The lack of security worries them, so retirement will not come. Previously, I said that nine digits kept me away from my first job. The sad reality is that it's not that many numbers that create this limitation. Rather, the difference of one number. Both Social Security number and ITIN contain nine digits. But what sets an ITIN apart is the number nine, the number that a Social Security number can never start with. The cage of limitations that an immigrant lives in is kept shut with the number nine. It is one thing to experience these things personally, but what it hurts more is to see them happen to someone that you love. I've been seeing my little sister grow up and experience the same limitations I did. This recently sank in. We were in the car and she happily read us an email that offered a big opportunity, claiming to be for Hispanics. Her eyes glowed with ambition. She rapidly translated every word to her parents, growing more and more content after each bullet point. Suddenly, her voice quivered. I can't do it, she said. They asked for a social security number. Her hopes shattered and tears fell down her face. An item mocks every stage of life of an immigrant. At the beginning, they're not allowed to work, drive, or build credit. Towards the middle, they must strain their bodies to the only jobs available. And towards the end, they must push even farther than most to maybe consider retirement. There is no peace in insecurity. There is no peace in feeling like an embarrassment for your actions. And there's definitely no peace in fearing your ability to get by when your body can no longer work. Everyone deserves a promised retirement. Their respective countries failed them first, but now America has failed them. Not only in the lack of knowledge from citizens of what an item means, which leads to unfair prejudice, but from the government unjustly keeping the retirement funds. Just because someone might not have those nine digits doesn't mean they don't deserve compensation for their work and to enjoy rest and retirement. Thank you. You look like you don't understand me. Why is that? I'm signing perfectly clearly. Okay, fine. Let's give this one more go. Communication is the foundation of peace. Did that make a little more sense? Communication is fundamental to the persistent existence and survival of people, communities, cultures, and nations. 
In our increasingly fast-paced world, one in which we are connected to every human merely by the phones in our pocket, the ability to understand and be understood has become a top priority. People are afraid to be misunderstood. It's awkward when the conversation goes awry. And socially irresponsible to approach someone when you can't even make polite conversation. Being misunderstood keeps us from people who are different from us. It allows us to bury our heads in the sand about injustices that are happening all around us. Language has the power to unify for peace or divide against it. It can be very tempting when talking about peace to inflate the ideas to a global magnitude. I know because in writing this speech, that was my intent. But as I continued to pursue this idea that language is a cornerstone for peace, I began to see peace less as a pillar where you could only build it vertically and more like a puzzle where every small piece holds structural integrity as peace spreads out in every direction. With this in mind, we're gonna start small today. We're not gonna talk about how to solve the problems of the global community, but instead how you can foster peace right here in your own community. One way we see language have a negative impact is in the deaf community. The deaf community is often marginalized or even ignored. Due to this, there is a lack of resources for the deaf community, qualified interpreters, proper education for both interpreters and the general public, and a historical oppression of the deaf community have all led to the downfall of communication. About 3.6% of the United States is deaf. That sounds like a really small number but that translates to about 11 million people. That's enough people to fill Soldier Field in Chicago 180 times. There are two types of deafness. The first is conductive and the second is sensory neural. Conductive hearing loss affects the ability to receive sound waves in the ear. Sensory neural happens when there's an interruption between the hearing signal and the brain. Deafness can be caused by genetic factors passed from parents to children, or it can result from infections, injuries, or exposure to dangerously loud sounds. The deaf community is vast with their own culture, their own customs, and their own language, and they are some of my favorite people in the entire world. But I want to make it very clear. I am not a spokesperson for the deaf community. I am just someone who cares deeply. I care enough that I have spent four years immersed in the culture and community, immersed in the struggles and immersed in the best practices for the community. All of you who know me know that I love to talk. I always was that kid who got she talks out of turn on class on my report card, and I cannot imagine a world where I couldn't, as my mom would say, ramble on and on. But this is the reality for most deaf people. 90 to 95% of children are born into hearing families. Often, they are unfamiliar with a natural sign language, and because of this, the immediate focus after birth shifts to an acquisition of spoken language, and this can be highly variable and unpredictable, leading to significant language deprivation for most, if not all, of the deaf community. Language deprivation has been shown to cause cognitive delays and mental health difficulties across entire lifespans. It is common for children with language deprivation to experience breakdowns in relationships due to an inability to communicate effectively. Imagine for a moment sitting around the lunch table at school or the dinner table at home. Your friend says something and everybody else laughs, but you can't because you don't know what she said. You try and get someone's attention, ask for an explanation, but by the time someone notices, the conversation has moved on. I'll tell you about it later, they say, but there never is a later explanation. Children develop an inferiority complex because of negative experiences like these at home, at school, and with peers, leading to feelings of incompetence. Not only that, but deaf children who grow up in hearing families quite frequently face a future of mainstreaming. What is mainstreaming? Mainstreaming is when a child is the only deaf person or part of a very few minority of, in a sea of hearing peers. This specifically applies to the educational environment, which I'm gonna focus on for just a quick second. Think about it. A typical classroom has a teacher stand in the front of a room, they speak lecture style, and they may be writing on a board where they turn their back to the class. That's not very conductive for someone who isn't an auditory learner. According to the National Deaf Center, deaf children receive a high school diploma, or GED equivalent, 10% less than their hearing peers. And a mere 6% of the 
of deaf community members obtain some post-secondary education, not even graduate. While in school, deaf children face a significant number of challenges, including language barriers, lack of adequate access to interpreters, and social barriers based around language. Let's do a little experiment. All of my interpreting brothers and sisters are surely familiar with the sentence, well, they can lip read, can't they? Students without access to proper interpreters are forced to use lip reading as their access to information. So I want you to imagine for a second, I have now become a professor at your hardest college course you have ever had to take, whatever that may be. And everything I say over the next 10 seconds is going to be on your final, which, by the way, is worth 50% of your grade. Got it? OK. Now show of hands. How many of you with 100% accuracy could recite that on a test worth 50% of your grade? The National Deaf Association states that only 30% of information can be gleaned from lip reading. And this is just one example of the numerous problems that the deaf community faces. I am a firm believer that connection, equality, and empathy are synonyms for peace. They are inseparable. Without one, the other cannot exist. In recognizing this, it's important to acknowledge how this can affect the deaf community. Most people are too afraid to bridge the gaps of culture and communication. But there are three simple ways to do this with the deaf community right now that will foster peace on a local scale. The first and most important thing I can call you to do is advocate for the use of funding for qualified interpreters. Often places will provide access to spoken language, like German or Spanish, but lack the resources for nonverbal communication. Creating peace with this can look like, if you're on the board of a speech committee, or the director of a theater program, hiring a well-vetted interpreter to have a night or two that is deaf accessible. This also means taking the opportunity to advertise that there will be an interpreter present. Most communities have a deaf Facebook group. Reach out and let them know that you will be providing an interpreter for whatever you are hosting. By doing this, you will be promoting peace through equality. My second suggestion is pick up and practice a few signs that we in the field call survival signs. These signs that will get you through small talk. Some examples include, hi, how are you? What's your name? What do you enjoy? This can make you more approachable in a retail or service situation. I work as a server in a restaurant, and I can't tell you the amount of times I've seen the look of relief on a deaf person's face when I approach them with my hands up, ready to sign. Or let's say you have a neighbor who is deaf. How awesome would it be to approach them and welcome them to the neighborhood? But most importantly, if you find yourself in a situation where you interact with a deaf person, don't panic. You also have the option of writing back and forth, either on a piece of paper or on your phone. In hearing culture, that might be considered rude, but in deaf culture, it is a-okay. It might be a little slower than you're used to, but forming authentic authentic and effective communication is worth it. By doing this, you will be promoting peace through connection. The final way to foster peace is to advocate for the deaf identity. Throughout history, people in the deaf community were called deaf and dumb. It was believed that people who had a physical disability must have a mental disability as well. And nowadays, people will say hearing impaired, which is not any better and far from the truth. The community asks that you use the word deaf, D-E-A-F, with a capital D. It isn't a bad word. It's a label that people in the community proudly wear. Hearing people tend to view deafness as a lack of hearing, a defect, rather than normal by a different standard like the deaf community does. This can lead to feelings of isolation, defectiveness, especially for those children who have no deaf role model in their lives. If you're a doctor or nurse, or you might be one in the future, Advocate for sign language as well as hearing amplification, like hearing aids or cochlear implants. Advocate for their deaf identity. If you find yourself with a close friend or family member who finds out they are deaf, do not despair at the hearing they don't have. Embrace the hearing they don't have. By doing this, you will be promoting peace through empathy. Equality, empathy, and connection. This is peace on a local scale. If each individual was to focus on creating small changes for peace in their own community, we could assuredly impact the global idea of peace. Each individual tiny piece adds more to a bigger picture, and it is just as important to the picture to see the foreground as it is to see the background. 
So whether it be challenging the status quo by advocating for the use of a qualified interpreter or advocating for the deaf identity, even if people are confused by why you do it, or even if it means disturbing the flow of the cafeteria by moving your hands slowly and clumsily to make a connection, remember that you are a part of peace and you are making the picture complete. Thank you. My grandfather could fix things. He volunteered his weekends to repair contraptions that would come through the donation drop-off at the thrift store near his home. He had a knack for problem solving, tinkering with clocks and fixing up furniture. And my grandmother could mend things too. My mom would gather my family's clothing with holes in the knees or snags in the fabric when we went to visit. And Graham would sit on the couch with her sewing box and meticulously stitch over the tears. My grandparents were not very big consumers. I've been, thinking lot of, I've been thinking a lot about my grandparents and consumption lately. In this part of the world, we consume so much. Food, gas, clothing. In our busy, bustling lives, we reach for whatever is cheap and convenient. This type of overconsumption leads Americans to take more than our fair share of the world's resources. Overconsumption is normal here, but there are many places where it isn't an option. There's not enough wealth to own a second closet of clothes you don't wear. There isn't a store that sells plastic-wrapped pre-made meals. There aren't highways for thousands of gas-guzzling automobiles. And there are many places that don't hide their lifestyles as well as we do. We have trash services to cart our waste to a more remote or poorer part of town adequate sewer systems, infrastructure to hide the effects of steadily worsening climate change. These services save us from having to see the impact we have on the world. A year ago, I was in Tanzania. I was welcomed by strangers who let me live with them for three months while I studied environmental justice. Before going, I considered myself a sustainable person. I knew what climate change was, and I thought it very important we start reversing it. But while I was there, I really began to understand the inequity of overconsumption. Tanzania used to be a colony, first of Germany, then Britain. Under colonial rule, it was stripped of natural resources without compensation. Exports like cotton lined the pockets of imperial powers. These powers broke up Tanzanian tribes and weakened their social structure. When they finally gained independence, they were ill-suited to participate in the global economy. This history is not unique to Tanzania. Developed countries across the globe were made possible by the consumption of stolen resources. I went to Tanzania 62 years after it gained its independence. While there, I learned to navigate public transportation, wash laundry by hand, and live in 90 degree weather without air conditioning. The World Bank has found that this type of consumption leads the average Tanzanian to produce just 0.2 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year. This number might not mean much to many of us, so I'll compare it to another number. The average American produces 13 metric tons. That's around 60 times more. People in Tanzania may be contributing 60 times less to climate change than Americans, but they are more likely to feel the impact of a changing climate because the country doesn't have the wealth and infrastructure to hide the effects. Trash must be thrown in backyards. Rising temperatures must be tolerated without AC. Bills must be paid without income after failed harvests. The more I learned about the history of the places I visited, the more infuriated I became with Americans, who have lost touch with the real world impact of our overconsumption. It's hard to take ownership of what is going on because we are individuals and we're dealing with a collective problem. Because we are people and we want to blame corporations. But when I look at my lifestyle, I still see places where I can cut back. 
I live in a country that makes up 4% of the world's population, but produces 12% of its trash. And remember, I produce roughly 60 times more carbon dioxide than my Tanzanian host sister. Even if the main problem is big corporations, I don't feel right about that. One change I made long before going to Tanzania is switching to a vegan diet. The meat and dairy industry has a huge environmental footprint. According to the National Institute of Health, animal industries contribute 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. I have been vegan for nearly five years now, and I can tell you that people love to tell vegans that cutting out meat and dairy is a privileged choice. You know not everyone can afford to eat like that, right? You know some people don't live near grocery stores that even sell fresh produce, don't you? I do. I have the privilege of having access to a vegan diet. I also know that with a global perspective, we see that vegetable protein is much cheaper and more accessible to people around the world than meat. Impoverished societies are much more likely to eat plant-based diets. And while the stereotypical vegan might be an upper middle class white person, Pew Resource Center has found that black Americans are almost three times more likely than white Americans to become vegan right now. And according to the Vegetarian Resource Group, people of color are reducing their meat consumption at a higher rate than white people. People in underprivileged communities are resisting the pressure from fast food companies, convenience stores, and factory farms to consume unhealthy processed food. Some see it as a form of liberation to resist the pool of these companies that target low-income populations. The system is stacked against people of color, yet they are outperforming their white counterparts in this crucial area. Statistically, low meat diets consume less energy and resources than high meat diets. I offer veganism as one example of how some people discredit choices that may require some level of privilege, even if they are privileged themselves. That some people are living in food deserts without access to fresh food is a problem. We should fix that problem. In the meantime, it does not mean that I should eat more meat. That some people live in neighborhoods where it's too dangerous to walk to work is a problem. It does not mean that I should drive everywhere I go, especially if I am privileged enough to choose not to. Because that is what it comes down to. Most Americans have immense privilege compared to people in other countries. And we got our privilege at the expense of other countries. And the effects of our lifestyle are heavily felt by other countries. And even if it's Walmart and Amazon and factory farms that have the most power to make change, I don't feel right going along with my life ignoring how much I consume. If you have the privilege of choosing whatever diet you want, whatever house, wardrobe, transportation system you want, Maybe you can start to think about your consumption, your carbon footprint. Plug your personal consumption data into an online carbon footprint calculator and take a look at the results. They might be eye-opening. It is hard to say no, to not go on the drive across town, to not eat meat, to not buy trash repeat. But when we thoughtlessly lean into convenient consumption, we forget what we believe in. We forget the people on the other side of the world. We forget the consequences of our actions. Taking the time to walk somewhere or to fix something like my grandparents did reminds us of our conviction to be world changers and peacemakers. We need to recognize that having the ability to make convenient choices is a privilege. Leaning into convenient consumption is inequitable. It is time to be a little inconvenienced. Lately, I've been really romanticizing journalism. My ideas of what it means to be a journalist are easily separated from the fear-mongering, agenda-setting types of news that my TV channels and timelines tend to feature. I have big ideas about traveling to the far corners of the world to cover stories that have yet to be told or to uncover something really juicy 
that the government doesn't want exposed. I've always liked the joke that goes, the highest honor in journalism isn't a Pulitzer Prize, it's being killed by the CIA. Regardless, there's a certain amount of appeal in reporting on a war. It feels like the perfect way for somebody who's committed to peace to further a cause, to shed light on atrocities, to raise awareness, and to ultimately bring help to people who are suffering. But it doesn't always work like that. So today, I want to look at reporting, how it can be an instrument for and against peace, and how I'm trying to think about that as a journalism student. War reporting is vitally important to any news outlet. During the Gulf War, 20 of America's 25 largest newspapers experienced circulation gains, while CNN's audience increased by 10. War sells. As the saying goes, if it bleeds, it leads. If it's a story with some shocking details, put it first, because that's how you get clicks. That's how you get attention. And this is something that I sit with. Is war reporting a noble cause? Or do too many news outlets get into the sensationalism of war, the gore and the shock value? so that more people will tune in and they can sell more ads for Mint Mobile and Copperfit. One idea that looks to combat this is peace journalism. Johann Gautung founded the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and the Journal of Peace Research. In 1969, he was appointed to the world's first chair in peace and conflict studies at the University of Oslo. Gautung came up with this idea of peace journalism. To understand what that is, it's almost easier for us to look at the opposite, war journalism which is journalism that focuses on coverage of violence and violent groups. This can cause audiences to put too high a value on violent responses and ignore other options. Peace journalism is the opposite. It seeks to find a better balance, to take the emphasis off the violence, to highlight stories of nonviolence and conflict resolution. One great example of journalism with a focus on peace came from Anders Hammer, who's a journalist from Norway who covered the war in Afghanistan in 2009. After writing about the war from Norway, he became frustrated with the difficulty in getting good information from the Norwegian army, and so he decided to move to Afghanistan to see what was happening for himself. He ended up making a documentary and highlighted a village where troops from the US, Afghanistan, and Norway were fighting the Taliban together. As a result of this fighting, civilians were dying. Hammer interviewed relatives and was able to put together a compelling story about the real impacts of war. Hammer was inspired by Galtung's ideas of peace journalism. He was people-focused, and he gave a voice to the voiceless. How we choose to report on war has an impact. Proponents of peace journalism argue that if we report on atrocities, it furthers the perpetrator's goals to destroy peace and the process of building peace. Additionally, this hurts peace groups because it takes publicity away from them, and it makes them look weak, effectively punishing them for their lack of violence. The narrative can be flipped on peace groups who end up looking like they're avoiding acknowledging the conflict happening around them or they just aren't being realistic. Using the same logic, reporting on peace-focused initiatives can allow for the continuation and creation of peace. So as I move forward, nearing entering the workforce, how can I make a difference? How can I fight against something so ingrained in the fabric of news as war reporting? It starts wherever I start, to find stories around me that are focused on peace. Whether that's in a war zone or on campus, it starts with the stories that I read and the stories that I share. I haven't had to cover a war, but I've had opportunities to live out these ideas of being people-focused and getting at the impact rather than the gory details. Working for our student newspaper, The Record, has shown me that the decisions that we make and the stories we write have an effect on people. A few weeks ago, I covered a group of students that went to Elkhart to participate in a pro-Palestine march. This is an important subject for a lot of people. There are strong personal connections to the area and people who are impacted, and strong feelings about the role that our government has played in the conflict. How does the record cover issues, not just this one, in a way that doesn't create divisions in the student body? It's a bit of a rhetorical question, but the answer lies in making an effort to cover as many perspectives as we can and ensuring that we have a diverse group of writers to cover these issues. Another good example of a place we have to be careful is the record's opinion page. The opinion page is great because it allows anybody to write about a topic however they feel, but that also makes it tricky. Getting diverse voices, covering a wide variety of issues, it's all hard and it requires intentional effort. Too often, that place is turned into a stage for fighting, a platform for highlighting really niche conflicts. Sometimes it's students with problems with other students or sometimes it's a place for students to punch up at administration, which is good. The record has a lot of weight 
People read it, believe it or not. Maybe not you, but somebody here does. <laughs> when we get something wrong, we hear about it. People write letters to the editor about issues they're passionate about. When GC students feel an injustice has occurred, a lot of times they turn to the record as an avenue to make their voice heard. The goal, though, is to make the record a place that challenges injustices rather than a place to fight each other. In the past few weeks, these ideas have been at the forefront of my mind. As news has unfolded regarding the history of sexual harassment of our former orchestra director, I've been deeply involved in reporting and writing on that story for the record. Working on that article has been good for remembering who we write for and the impact of our reporting. We've tried to cover the events in a way that fosters community, but we still get tempted to put the worst thing up front. Last week, we ran the story above the fold. It's an attention grabber. But we also featured a page of nothing but quotes and feelings from the orchestra, which in my mind is the best way that we could have told that story. If you haven't read that version of the story, it's on newsstands for two more days, and it's online. It's the community, relationship-focused way of telling the story, and I think that it's the most powerful. You can't please everyone, though. After the issue came out, we were accused of muckraking and practicing yellow journalism, which is journalism that's based on sensationalism and crude exaggeration. It's a weird feeling to be accused of the very thing you're a few days away from speaking against. This isn't a war that I'm covering, but I'm trying to apply these same ideas of peace journalism. If peace journalism is about peace and the humanity of an issue, I'm trying to take that approach into how I cover other topics. Yes, we need to get the facts out there, but then how can we focus on the people who are impacted rather than the gory details? And there's a balance. We need both types of stories, the stories that punch at injustices and the stories that foster community. In reflecting on this idea, I realized that the stories that I love the most are the stories that demonstrate the humanity of an issue, the stories of people overcoming circumstances, of the ways people find to continue to live their life. Those are the stories of peace, the stories of people refusing to give in to the violence that surrounds them. As we continue to live with the ongoing fighting in Gaza, in Ukraine, and many, many other places, I encourage each and every one of you to find the stories of peace and to cling to them. Share the stories of peace workers and help them further their cause. Give them an audience. If we do that, we can build up peace rather than trying to tear down violence. Thank you. I invite you all to think of an objectively oppressed group in our society. Who quickly comes to your mind? You probably think of groups like disabled people, immigrants, people of color, women, indigenous people, or the queer community, right? Now, I'd like you to consider the children in those groups, migrant children girls of color, Native American children, transgender ch children, or children with disabilities. I believe that children are an oppressed class and that we try to pretend we don't treat them like one. The reality is that our society severely discriminates against children, and their liberation is essential to creating a more compassionate world where every individual, regardless of age, is valued. When I make this claim to people that children are an oppressed class, their reaction is typically one of confusion and offense. They say things like, well, we can't have children voting or driving. To clarify, <laughs> I do not believe that children should be able to drive or make adult decisions. What I do believe is that the current power imbalance between children and adults is extreme, and it should be examined and challenged. Accepting children as people does not mean treating them as if they are adults. It wasn't until 1989 that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child stated that traditional perceptions of children as objects and as the property of parents hinder their right to express their views and to participate in the family, schools, and local communities. The United States is the only UN country to reject this declaration. 
This past summer, while completing training modules for a camp position, I was shocked by the classification of child abuse. According to their system, the following are not considered physical abuse or maltreatment. Slapping a child in anger when there are no injuries, spanking when there are no injuries, calling a child stupid, good for nothing, or not worth the space they take up. I got these questions wrong in the module. The disrespect that children face is part of larger social attitudes that fail to see their humanity. The most pressing concerns fall under the lack of choice children encounter, as well as the emotional and physical safety that they are often denied. This is the one form of oppression with which all humans can identify, having suffered from it directly. It is not an oppression of a tiny minority to which few will ever belong. Why do we as adults always seem to forget what it was like to be a child? Meanwhile, with any oppressed group in society, it is vital to consider intersectionality. All children are oppressed, but a white child with more resources has a much different reality than an immigrant child. From home to school, children's lives are entirely run by adults, the very group from which prejudice against children comes. Children choose so little about their lives. They don't get to pick where they live or even something as simple as what they will wear. We make assertions about their lack of agency or capacity for choice about their ability to express interest or reason. When I worked in an after-school program and things were getting overwhelming, noise, movement, chaos, despite my knowledge of best practices, in moments of stress, I would revert to what I knew. I would yell at my students and assign punitive punishments. Of course, once the situation settled, I would regret it and apologize. Italian physician and educator Maria Montessori wrote about this in her book, The Child and the Family, saying that this adult attitude is so deeply rooted in the family that it is even applied to the child who is greatly loved. Furthermore, it is intensified in the school. So, even the people who care the most are not immune. When working with children, I will often observe people assume the worst in a child. They yell at children, demanding that they sit still or be quiet. They assign these behaviors as personal moral failings of children. But it is never personal. They are merely learning how to navigate the world and their bodies. Punitive manipulation harms a child's emotions and is often overlooked. Methods like grounding or threats yield short-term results but have lasting negative impact effects on the child's mental health. But corporal punishment is probably what first comes to mind when thinking of child abuse, which makes sense because it is easier for people to see and denounce. We must remember that how children are oppressed extends beyond the first thing that comes to mind. For example, due to the internet, the circulation of child sexual abuse material known as child pornography has exploded. The fact that it is referred to as child porn is problematic. More accurate term is child sexual abuse material, which emphasizes its criminal nature and the harm it inflicts. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, sexual abuse affects one in four girls and one in 13 boys in their childhood. Let's also take a moment to examine the state of education in the United States. There is a grave lack of investment in the people who spend the most time with children, teachers. There is punitive punishment, such as taking away recess time or sending students to the office, as opposed to restorative practices. There are systemically racist structures that disproportionately impact students of color, such as suspension and expulsion, all feeding into the school-to-prison pipeline. The Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network found that on average, a queer high school student will hear 26 anti-LGBTQ slurs per day, a third of which come from a school staff member. Parents have the right to refuse special education services. 
They can even disagree with the eligibility determination regardless if the school and child believe otherwise. These are all alarming moments in which children lack personal or systemic agency. Two other systems that disproportionately affect children are climate change and war. The climate crisis is one of the most pressing issues of our time. Young people are especially worried about it, and with reason, they are most at risk. Children are inheriting the crisis created by the adults before them. The United States Environmental Protection Agency reports that children are more vulnerable than the general population to the health impacts of climate change, such as heat, poor air, and water quality. In 2022, as a Maple Scholar, student Isabella Rees found 291 EPA violations in Elkhart County, 120 in churches and schools alone, places where children frequent. As for war, in the time that I have been on this stage, at least one child was killed in Gaza. Children who make up nearly half of Gaza's population have had their lives destroyed by this conflict. More than 12,600 children have been killed, according to Palestinian health officials. Take a moment to look around the Umbul Auditorium. The house seats a little over 400 people. To accommodate the number of dead bodies, we would need at least 30 of these auditoriums. It is even more disturbing to consider the wars on children occurring in countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. According to the Council on Foreign Relations, since 1996, around six million people have died in the conflict with nearly half being children under the age of five, despite making up less than a quarter of the population. What intensifies this tragedy is that intersectionality piece. They are not only children, but black and brown bodies being murdered and nobody is talking about it. Changing how we work with children and how we view them must come from a society as a whole. Children are our future. Shouldn't we invest in them for the sake of humanity? The equitable treatment of children will cultivate a generation capable of positively contributing to society, laying the groundwork for not only peace, but justice. Not all of us are in positions to change the autonomy uh, children have in our society, but there are tangible things we can do. If you are a parent or work and education, strive to give children the benefit of the doubt and look into restorative practices. If you are an elected official, hold youth listening sessions and create youth committees. Children are part of your constituencies too. The bottom line is that we all have youth in our lives. Here's my simple challenge for you the next time you encounter a child. Ask them a genuine question. Not something superficial like, what's your favorite color? Then, make an effort to truly listen to what they say. There are many areas in which children must remain children. But if you give them a chance, they might surprise you. Thank you. Wow, let's give them all a round of applause. Very, very well done, finalists. I will now dismiss the judges to do the important, vital work that they are here to do. While the judges are deliberating, please stay. Please stay and enjoy the refreshments. We have tea and coffee and spinach dip and tons of cookies. So please hang out and stay. 
One request, the food and drink must stay in the Yost room and the lobby, not in the Humble Center with the beautiful new chairs and carpet. So whether you are here in Humble or you're joining remotely, I do invite you to wait for the judge's announcement. I will return to the stage and we will announce the first and second place winners. Thank you so much. Thank you all for staying till the end for a very tough decision. I would like to announce the runner-up, second place for the 2024 C. Henry Smith Peace Oratorical Contest. Mariella, please come to the stage. for this year is Annika. And a big round of applause for all the finalists. Thank you so much. for the 2025 contest. See you next year.